All right, so low stomach acid, very common condition. It goes up with age. Uh, it continues to be something that the mainstream medical establishment just seems to really want to ignore and pretend is not a problem. Um, but the evidence that that is that it is a problem is mounting, and it's going to get harder and harder to deny both how common this is and, and how much of an issue it is there, especially now that we have so much iatrogenic achlorhydria with people taking proton pump inhibitors and all the problems I went over previously with those. Um, it's just really an issue. So one way, there's several ways to find out about this, but I want to highlight briefly that you can measure serum gastrin levels, and generally if someone's achlorhydric, it's their level, serum gastrin is going to be over 400. Um, if, if it is actually over 1,000, then you want to seriously consider if they actually have gastrinoma, which is a benign, usually, tumor that's just pouring out gastrin. But those patients actually usually have hyperchlorhydria. So that would be an unusual case. Uh, anyway, they, you may see a high number when they have total achlorhydria. Um, the other thing to definitely think about in achlorhydric patients is this condition called pernicious anemia, which really we should probably call uh, autoimmune gastritis. And so the immune system is killing the uh, chief cells and then sort of incidentally it's attacking the parietal cells because all the immune damage and inflammation and so the person is not making stomach acid they're not making vitamin B12 or, excuse me they're not making the various proteins to absorb vitamin B12 efficiently and so they have a pretty serious disease, and that requires a very different treatment, uh, which we're not going to get into, but just want to make sure people are aware of that. The kind of best test for this is something that's called the Heidelberg test, or also that can be done with other mechanisms where basically a probe is placed in the stomach and you're measuring the exact pH, especially after bicarbonate challenges. Because some people, they can, initially they may have acid in their stomach, but as soon as you try to give them the equivalent of food or bicarbonate, they can't make more acid. They're sort of functionally hypochlorhydric. Uh, so in terms of like string testing or hydrochloric acid challenges, I really think those are completely inaccurate. Um, the idea that if you give a whole bunch of capsules of hydrochloric acid to someone and they have no symptoms, means that they're hypochlorhydric is fundamentally flawed because if you, you will find that you can give lots of acid capsules to perfectly healthy people and their bodies can tolerate it because we're not just, basically we don't have just the perfect amount of acid and even the slightest bit more does not cause us to have burning pain. Our stomachs can adapt to having higher levels than are necessarily physiological. So um, yeah, I really would emphasize that. Anyway, assuming you figured out that's what's going on, and it is very common, then the first thing to think about in my mind are bitters. And of course, these are going to come up with all these conditions again tonight because we're trying to stimulate the GI tract. Um, occasionally, if the pathology is severe enough, like in autoimmune gastritis, bitters are not going to work. There's no cells there to stimulate. You can give bitters all day long. It's not going to bring back your stomach acid. So those people do actually need hydrochloric acid supplements or some kind of acid replacement. But we're talking here about milder cases. They have low stomach acid. It's not a total loss of cells. And of course, the other thing is if they're on acid-blocking drugs, we are not going to be giving them bitters to try to stimulate more acid because the drug will block that from happening. It just doesn't really so uh, assuming that's not the case, then we want to start thinking about bitters. There's so many bitters, so I just chose a handful. I think the main takeaway message I'm hoping to promote here is, first of all, to use your local bitters, because there's plenty of local herbs that are bitter. You don't need to ship these around the world or um, use whatever exotic one you hear about. 
So focus on that and then just basically kind of titrating to the, the potency of the bitters as you learn what's local to you. Always paying attention, like what seems to be really, really bitter and what's kind of mildly bitter because especially if you're working with people who have not used bitters before, you don't want to hit them with the most potent, intense, overpowering bitter you can find, like a gentiana species. You know, it's a lot better to start with a milder one and kind of get them used to it and work them up to those stronger things. But, of course, the more serious their disease, the stronger bitters you're going to have to use. So Menianthes uh, trifoliata, or bog bean, is one that I've uh, been using a lot lately. It is a native, really circumboreal plant anywhere there's wetlands in the northern hemisphere. Um, definitely in temperate areas is where we find it. And that's a bit of a problem because, of course, wetlands are places humans like to build cities and drain and find pleasant. So. Uh, that's a little bit of a challenge, but there's still lots of it around. And we do use the root, but you can use the leaves. They're certainly bitter. Uh, I would call this a moderate to strong bitter. It is in the gentian ACA family, so it's certainly pretty strong. But this is also quite astringent. So some bitters have tannins mixed in with them, some don't. And that's one of the things that's pretty great about gentian is it really has pretty minimal uh, astringency. But Manianthes has lots of astringency. So this would be appropriate when there's basically some other condition you want to astringe. But they're having the tonifying effect not just purely by stimulating but also by kind of rebuilding through the astringence is how I think of it. Uh, you're not really going to have to worry too much about this uh, binding up minerals and such, um, it's not that astringent. And especially if you're using like one to two mils of tincture in water kind of sipped before a meal. And that's pretty much the best way to use all bitters. And I'll kind of summarize at the end um, and review some of those details. Eh, no, I'll talk about it now. Um, one of the tricks of that kind of sipping the bitters before meals is that you get people to slow down a little bit before they're going to digest. And of course, digestion is a parasympathetic mode, so to speak. So you really want to get people relaxed, if at all possible, before they're going to eat. And that will optimize your chance of getting them making acid. Um, so that's important. Another really important note is my very strong clinical experience is that even people who at first really hate bitters, they have a very strong negative reaction. If you can get them to just stick with it for a few days, so often I'll just say just do it for five days, at least twice a day, ideally with each meal, but at least twice a day, it is astonishing how people come to tolerate them or even like them. So really Give them that message, say, I know at first it can be really difficult, but hang in there and you'll be amazed. It's not 100%, but it's close. And I'm really astonished how many people don't just, some will, you know, tolerate them, but to actually like them.